and verse 9. Let's read it aloud together. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are called uh, people of God uh, to separate ourselves from the world, from the ways of the world, from the people of this world. Not coming out in the sense that we have no more contact, as we know, but we do not embrace their values. We do not love the things that they love. We're citizens of a heavenly kingdom, and we seek to honor God with our lives. We don't consider that we're our own. We don't pursue our own interests or goals. We've been called out of that darkness. That's the darkness that we once walked in, living for self. Amen? But now as a chosen generation, a peculiar people, uh, a, a royal priesthood, we're, we live our lives unto God, oriented toward him with a mind toward the things that are above. Amen? Our affections set on the things that are above, not on things on this earth. Who has the other reference from Sunday? Mike Bergen? Psalm 119, verse 63. Let's go there and read that one together. Psalm 119, verse 63. Never will you regret any time devoted to memorizing God's scripture, hiding his word in your heart. Let's read together verse 63. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Well, on Sunday morning, we were talking about who our friends are. Amen? Our friends are the people of God, people of like precious faith, people that... The Lord, according to his sovereign purpose, is put in our lives. Our brothers and sisters in the Lord. Those are our true friends, our companions. Amen? Those that love God with their all, that fear him, that keep his precepts. Psalm 119, verse 63. Turn with me this evening to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. And it's from this psalm that we take our title, which is From Everlasting to Everlasting. Look with me down to verse 17. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Well, I did a little bit of looking in preparation, you know, brought along some numbers. <clears throat> and the word mercy... As you might imagine, it appears a whole bunch of times in the Bible. In fact, it appears 276 times in the Bible. Isn't that wonderful? It's a pretty major theme of the word of God, isn't it? The word merciful is another 40 times. Tender mercies, 11 times. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot in the scripture regarding God's mercy toward us. As we talk on the subject this evening... And really what we're going to do is visit a number of scriptures and, uh, and just allow the Lord to minister, minister to our hearts by his spirit uh, regarding his goodness toward us. Sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll talk of mercy uh, from the perspective of God's forgiveness. And that is certainly a significant part of his mercy. We don't experience the wrath of God. We know his forgiveness don't we? But mercy is not just forgiveness. Those words uh, really shouldn't be considered uh, altogether synonymous. It's out of the Lord's goodness and kindness and mercy that he does forgive us. His disposition toward us is, is, is goodness. That is, he is disposed toward doing good, being kind, being compassionate. So when we talk about mercy, I know sometimes, you know, we conjure up a picture of somebody that's, you know, that's about to have the book thrown at them or beaten and they cry out for mercy, that they would be spared uh, the wrath of, of the one that was about to, to punish them, right? But uh, we might reason that that's always the case with us. We deserve wrath, don't we? But God's disposition is not 
uh, just to spare us wrath, his disposition toward us is to do us good, to be kind toward us, gentle, caring, and compassionate. And, and you know, remember kindness, love that word, the, the, the biblical understanding. Amen? It's, a, it's goodness in action, isn't it? It's not just refraining from uh, doing evil, okay, he'll cut us some slack and he won't, uh, won't pour out wrath upon us because he was kind. No, uh, kindness is goodness in action. God is, is very actively doing good to us. Always working on our behalf, isn't he? And that will include forgiving us of our iniquities. We'll look at a few of those verses here in Psalm 103. But it's <clears throat> more broadly just doing good, looking out for our well-being always. Always. And how we need to bear that in mind uh, as being true regarding the character of our God. Always true. Is God sometimes more good to you than at other times? Well, We've got the little sayings, don't we? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we might say God is good all the time, but it sure would be nice if he was good toward me all the time. <laughs> That's about the way we, uh, <clears throat> we characterize God sometimes. Maybe not expressing it that way, but we sometimes wonder if he's good toward us, and he is always good toward us. And that's, what we'll, again, some of the things that we'll talk about this evening. He is, is very ready to pardon and willing to forgive. And we'll look at some passages of scripture that uh, talk to us on those themes. But also, very broadly and generally, he is doing good for us because he cares for us. Very compassionate. He's a loving Heavenly Father. And now we need to remember that regardless of what's going on. Amen? Sometimes we're up against some, some uh, difficult circumstances, some trials. Uh, <clears throat> Sometimes we wonder about our future, don't we? We look forward and, you know, what will come of life? And we somehow, even as Christians, forget how short this earth existence is and make much too much of it. But God is very merciful. He deals gently with us, bringing us back to an awareness of his work in us, conforming us to the image of Jesus, uh, the reality that he has gone to prepare a place for us, coming back to, to receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we may be also. And we recognize and we're reminded, taught of God's spirit, that here in this life he's always working to, to, uh, uh, to, to free us of, of the, the things that so enslave the unregenerate and, uh, and to really uh, do his work of making us more like him, causing us to grow up into him in all things. That's his goodness, always working on our behalf, in us and on our behalf for our well-being. So let's look up uh, to the top of this same uh, 103, Psalm 103. And the scripture reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Well, you know, when you start thinking about the goodness of God, when we, uh, if we are tempted uh, to think about how uh, life has been hard, or maybe not always, but right now it's hard, uh, and, uh, and couldn't God have done better? And we talk about that not infrequently because it's where we live on a real regular basis. Uh, it would be nice if things were better. Uh, and we've, in, in, in so, so saying, we, we testify of how we've lost sight of who God is and our confidence in, in his care for us. Forget not all his benefits. That's a good practice, isn't it? Forget not all his benefits. And then, of course, Topping out the list, what? Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. That rightly tops out the list, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep, all, of all the benefits that we partake of at the good hand of God, he does not hold us guilty for the sins against him that we have committed. He does not hold our sin against us. He has forgiven all our iniquities. The soul that sins dies, and rightly so. 
God's a just God. He's not overly harsh or severe. When he condemns a sinner to hell, he does so justly. He is still a God of love and is still a, a full of compassion. But he's a holy God. And the likes of us, yeah, we sin. Inexcusably, we sin. And he is ready to pardon and willing to forgive. He forgives all our iniquities. We rejoice in his goodness, his kindness, his care, his compassion, his mercy, which is from everlasting to everlasting. Sometimes good Christian people, as I was fellowshipping with, <clears throat> with one the other day, and, and, you know, in ministry that they've brought to their dad, who, you know, was, who, you know times he said he's he saved, you know, his thought, the dad is, is said in the past that he just doesn't believe that the Lord could ever forgive him. Sometimes Christians have to contend with those thoughts. Or maybe, you know, not totally unforgiven, but could never fully restore the joy that you once knew and walked in. Because all the ways you've led him down, all the infidelity that has characterized your walk, the inconsistency, the, the vows that were made and have never been kept. Could God ever really forgive me? I mean, really fully put that past and, and fully restore the joy of my salvation, of his salvation, his gift to me. The mercy of God, the goodness of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Never will you wear out his readiness to pardon and his willingness to forgive. If indeed he teaches us that we are to forgive 70 times 7, and, and, and that is, that's just making the point, isn't it? That is not a definite and exact number that we're limited or that, 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 that once we have reached 70 times 7, then no longer are we responsible to forgive our brother. No, that's, that's not the way we read that. We just get the point. The Lord is making the point to us that that is how we are to forgive. And if, he for, if we are to forgive that way, would he hold himself to a lower standard? His mercy toward us, which includes his forgiveness, is from everlasting to everlasting. He forgives all our iniquities. Run to Jesus. Don't sit on it. Don't harbor it. Don't hold on to it. Confess it and allow him to forgive. Allow him to, to pick you up out of the miry clay. He's a merciful God. His disposition toward you, toward the people of God, toward all of us, is, is one of goodness and kindness and care and compassion. Verse 8 of this same psalm will stay here. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. These words are inspired by the Holy Spirit. God wanted them recorded. These are not just uh, songs that David wrote extolling the virtues of his, his, uh, his God and King. These are words that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were written for our edification. Amen? Yes. The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. He hasn't done that. That's proven. That's established, isn't it? You know, if somebody's feeling down, you know, regarding their circumstance, maybe they're down on themselves because of, of their, of their, their uh, unfaithfulness in their walk with the Lord. Maybe they're down just because uh, circumstances seem to, uh, seem to have uh, not gone the way they've uh, wanted them to go. He's not dealt with us after our sins. We, we didn't get what we deserved. And that's good news. Amen? We have not gotten what we deserved. That, you know, uh, keeping that truth in clear focus will ever be a source of joy for the believer. Just overwhelming, abounding, upwelling joy for the soul of the saint. He has not dealt with us after our sins, 
nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. The Lord wants us to know that our sins and our iniquities are, are just infinitely out of his sight. You know, we judge people. Maybe somebody does us wrong. They've come and sought forgiveness and we sincerely forgive them. But, you know, we still feel it, don't we? We have this tendency sometimes to, you know, to, to maybe put up a, a little bit of a distance or, or, or remember some of the wrong that was done. And it's not like we're deliberately uh, holding that against them, but we sometimes have to contend with that, don't we? Yeah, sometimes it, it takes a while to work past that. And okay, things are back to normal again after a while. With God, no, it's instantaneous. He does not look upon us and think, oh yeah, that's, I love the way we're told <clears throat> um, elsewhere in the scripture <clears throat> uh, that we are to know no man after the flesh. Yeah, though we knew Christ after the flesh, you know, henceforth we know him, uh, we know him that way no more. Yeah, we don't, we don't know each other. We're not to hold each other um, in bondage, if you will, to some impression of who this person is and what they are like when it's an ungodly impression. You know, so-and-so is, okay, that's, you know, they're just sort of grumpy or they're just sort of uh, moody or, uh, you know, they're just selfish or they're stubborn or they're... And we have these characterizations sometimes that we attach to our brothers and sisters. God does not do that with us. Is as often as you may have as, uh, uh, demonstrated the laziness, the stubbornness, the rebellion, the whatever it might be, you come to him, you ask for forgiveness, and he's, okay, well, that's just, yeah, okay, I forgive you. But, but, and from there, it's not, but yeah, I, I just know you're, that's still who you are. No, it's not like that with our father. Mm -mm. He sees that gone as far as the east is from the west. That's his mercy. That's the mercy of the Lord that causes us to deal with us compassionately and caringly and not characterizing because he doesn't know us uh, according to our Adamic nature. That stuff belongs to the Adamic nature, doesn't it? That's that old man. And he doesn't know us according to our old man, does he? No. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions. That's sin. So far as he removed our transgressions from us. Would to God that we would get a little bit better at doing this, you know, toward one another. Amen? And our attitude toward one another. The mercy of the Lord, verse 17. The mercy of the Lord. Think just goodness and care. Not just the forgiveness of sins, but goodness and care and compassion. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children to such as keep his covenant and to those that remember his commandments to do them. It goes me over to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. <clears throat> Not unlike uh, the, the order uh, we just... Uh, took note of in Psalm 103 regarding the benefits uh, of God that we ought to remember. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Well, in a similar <clears throat> sense, that's what the Lord communicates to us here from this passage in Exodus 34, where uh, declaring himself to Moses, and we'll just read verse 6, and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. See that? Among, uh, again, topping out the list of what the Lord wanted to communicate to his friend Moses is that he was merciful and gracious. Amen? Amen. It, it wasn't the Lord, the Lord God, powerful and eternal. It was merciful. 
God really wants us to be aware of his mercy. See, sin, as we recognize, we've, we've talked of it, you've taken time and considered it uh, just there as it's recorded in Genesis and, uh, and probably uh, considered it from your own personal experience in the Lord that, that the sin, the unrighteousness, the unfaithfulness, the lack of consistency in our, walks with, in our walk with the Lord <clears throat> tends, us to make, tends to make us afraid of him, doesn't it? Uh, we're, 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 we're fearful of coming into his holy presence and uh, concerned about how he views us and how he looks upon us. And he wants us to know he's merciful, not just mighty and powerful and holy and has the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the power and authority to damn us to hell. Uh, nope, he wants us to know him as being a very merciful God, very caring, very compassionate. He wants us to know him that way. Amen. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Go with me over to Psalm 25. We'll keep moving there. A lot of passages that <clears throat> I'd like to touch on. I don't know that we'll get to them all, but we'll keep moving. Wonderful subject. Wonderful God. We pick it up in verse 4 of Psalm 25. The psalmist writing, Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. In our relationship with the Lord, uh, this should be our attitude of heart. We should come before the Lord and, and communicate to him very plainly our desire to know him more, walk in his will for our lives, uh, that he would fill us with the knowledge of his will and grant us the grace to walk in his will. Amen. It should be our attitude toward him. He's, he's our father. He's our God. And our, we come to him and we just said, no, Lord, I want to fulfill your plan and purpose. I want my, my thoughts to be as they, as they ought to be, my mind set on the things that are above. I, I want to fulfill your plan and purpose for my life. And so the psalmist writes here, teach me your ways and lead me in thy truth. Teach me, <clears throat> for thou art the God of my salvation. And thee do I wait all the day. And then he says, remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have <clears throat> been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Well, again, if we come before the Lord and we are inviting him to take our lives into shape and mold and direct as he would see fit, then we might reasonably have to contend with thoughts of our unworthiness, past failures. Amen. But the, the psalmist writes here with a, with a wonderful confidence and really a, comfortable, a very, very evident comfortableness in the relationship. Amen? Teach me your ways. You, you know my heart. You know me. I want to know your will. want to walk in your ways. And he's not so concerned that God is going to hold against him past failures that he's, you know, that he's, he's not going to be given any more chances. No. He says, remember not the sins of my youth. Don't, you know, I, 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 I believe that you won't hold those against me. Going forward, we can, we can do so without having to, uh, to be burdened with a, with a guilt over uh, what I failed to do or what I, what I did and shouldn't have done in the past. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, will he teach sinners in the way? He teaches sinners in the way. How about that? Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. That's, that's the likes of us. That's who we are. The Lord is good and upright. I mean, that's about all we've given him to work with. Right? He's going to teach sinners in the way. Yeah, okay, this is what we got to work with. Well, yeah, see what we can make out of him. You know what he's going to make out of him. He's going to make him into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We're being conformed to the image of Jesus. God's not disappointed that this is all the raw material he's got to work with. No, no. God is, God is quite a visionary. <laughs> Amen? Amen. He truly calls those things which are not as though they were. He sees the end from the beginning. Good and upright is the Lord. 
That again is, is, is character and his disposition toward us is one of goodness, isn't it? He teaches sinners in the way. He takes the likes of us. And, um, and how many times do you, uh, <clears throat> uh, do you think you have to sin before God is no longer ready and willing to teach you in his good way? How many times do you have, uh, 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 might you have, have to let him down, disappoint him, be unfaithful, inconsistent before he'd give up on you? Or, you know, just uh, uh, not totally give up. Maybe we don't allow our thinking to go quite there, but just uh, semi-give up and, and, uh, and uh, reconcile us to the, those that will never amount to much because... Uh, uh, God just uh, uh, tired of dealing with our carnality. No, we shouldn't think that way because the mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, wane. It doesn't fade. He is no more good toward us or he is no more inclined toward doing good for us than he has ever been. Amen? <clears throat> the meek will he guide in judgment. The meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. He goes on, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach his way, teach the way that he shall choose. <clears throat> Go with me over to Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah chapter 9. There are a couple instances recorded in the book of Nehemiah where Nehemiah is making intercession uh, for the people of God, standing as a, he's a governor, but he's also standing in a, in a, a priestly role, interceding for the, for the people. <clears throat> and he is, uh, making reference to the, uh, the, the words that were spoken to the people of God centuries prior, where God uh, told them that, uh, that he would be with them and bless them and, and uh, uh, defeat their enemies before them. And if they were to turn away from him and start serving false gods, then he would send their enemies against them and scatter them and destroy them. And, and if from their place of of exile, they would repent and call on the name of the Lord. Then the Lord said he promised them that this is the way it would go. He would pardon them and have mercy upon them. And these are the, the kinds of things that Nehemiah is bringing before the Lord as he intercedes for the people of God. And we're just going to jump on in at verse 17 of chapter 9. <clears throat> and refused to obey, neither were mindful of thy works that thou didst among them, but hardened their necks. Well, you think we are really jumping in, aren't we? Yep. And in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage, but thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Well, we should remember... <clears throat> that we have a wonderful example in the, in the children of Israel uh, for uh, a great example of the mercy of God. Uh, we have recorded in a chapter after chapter over many centuries the unfaithfulness of God's people. I mean, they, they were guilty of wicked things. And we could sit here today and think, you know, I've not been as true to my to my true in my commitment of the Lord <clears throat> as, I, as I ought to have been. I've not been uh, faithful. I've been inconsistent. But, you know, I've not stooped so low as to, uh, you know, to start worshiping false gods and, uh, you know, and, and 
you know, they, they, where I just totally forsook uh, the, the Lord and his people. Uh, and we would judge that the, you know, the, the children of Israel were a much worse lot than we are. Uh, but what do we see in God's dealings with them? And he's very, very merciful and very long-suffering. Amen? Amen? Very, very merciful and very long-suffering. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And he did not forsake them, did he? No. And God doesn't forsake us. His word to us is that he will never leave us or forsake us. And he is ready to pardon. Ready to pardon. That's ready to pardon. How'd you do today in your walk with the Lord? Hmm? How devoted to him were you? Have you been? Uh, are, you know, if, would, it be, uh, would it be difficult for you to think of some things that you did that you shouldn't have done or things that you shouldn't have done or sh should have done and didn't do today? God's ready to pardon, ready to pardon. His disposition toward us is one of goodness. He is disposed toward doing good. He is inclined toward doing good, ready to pardon. And we have, yep, in the children of Israel, a great example of just how ready to pardon he is. Psalm 41. Let me do verses three and four. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing. Thou wilt make all his bed and his sickness. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. You know, we do talk of, of the a significant aspect of the mercy of God being his forgiveness, his readiness to forgive, his inclination, his disposition toward uh, of forgiving us of our iniquities. We should be a people who are quick to ask God for forgiveness, acknowledge our iniquity. Amen? Amen. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> we could all uh, very generally say that I'm not as holy as I should be, not as consecrated as I ought to be, not as zealous as, as, uh, as I know I can and should, should be. Uh, but are there specific sins that you might identify before the Lord? Uh, you know, where maybe you're unkind, impatient. Uh, you give place to lustful thoughts, uh, laziness. Uh, I, mean, I don't mean to wreck anybody's day, but we could go on and on the list. And um, uh, We should be uh, open with God and acknowledge the work of his Holy Spirit in us. When his Holy Spirit's uh, identifying sin in our lives, then we should be ready to acknowledge that that sin is there. Amen? Because the Holy Spirit doesn't just uh, come along to make us feel generally uneasy, does he? No. No. He would come to deal with specific sin if it's there, wouldn't he? Yes, he would. If there's some specific sin that, that, that I am moving in, a failure on my part to do what I ought to do or something that I'm doing that I should not be doing. The Holy Spirit deals with things specifically, doesn't he? We should be aware of that and acknowledge that and ask God to pardon that sin. Aware that, knowledge, knowing that he is ready to do so. But not just, oh, you know, uh, there's, there's, um, you know where in, um, in uh, Luke 18, the Lord speaks of the two men that went up to the temple. The one was the Pharisee and he, uh, uh, he wanted to boast before the Lord about how good he was, right? I thank thee, God, that I, I, uh, I fast twice in a week, give tithes of all I possess, and, and I'm not a wicked person like that publican over there is, right? Um, and the publican over there can't even lift up his eyes, you know, to, to the Lord. He just beats on his breast and says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, uh, 
that's, that's a, a good attitude of heart uh, in, in that it's, um, there's a, a brokenness and a humility, amen, a communicated and expressed awareness of, of that man's unworthiness. That should be there in us, shouldn't it? But there should be a readiness on our part also to speak specifically to any known sin. Uh, if, we're, if we're before the Lord and, and, uh, and we're convicted of the Holy Spirit, then acknowledge the sin and say, God, I ask you to forgive me of, of this sin and help me by your grace to not walk in that sin any longer. And then having confessed your sin, you can move in the confidence that you are forgiven of that sin. Amen? Amen. It's not just a, I'm not doing so well, but God, if you would be nice to me, and then, you know, hopefully you'll start feeling better about you. No. Deal with the specific. Okay, this is what I did, God. I believe you're convicting me of this sin, and I ask you to forgive me of it. I believe you do. And then you move on, don't you? Yeah. No condemnation. That sin has been dealt with. No, no, you don't have to deal with any lingering guilt or uncertainty. No, the Holy Spirit is only there to encourage you at that point, isn't he? Yeah, because you dealt with matters as they ought to have been dealt with. <clears throat> Be merciful, for I have sinned against thee. Name the sin, if there's one to name. And if there isn't one to name, then you don't need to be asking for God's forgiveness. Do you? No, no. Go with me to Psalm 57. Mercy is kindness, it's compassionate, it's caring, isn't it? Yeah. From verse 1, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Well, <clears throat> uh, this doesn't sound like one who's coming to have his sins forgiven necessarily, does it? No, it just sounds like one who's looking for, for care and protection, doesn't it? Yep, he's going to snuggle up next to God. Uh, and, and know the, the protection of God's covering wings. In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all these things for me. He shall send from heaven and save from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Well, <clears throat> because God's, uh, God is inclined toward doing good, then we are a people that run to him. Amen? For his mercy. Translate care. Translate compassion. Amen? We run to him. Yeah. Life at any given, you know, on any given day can be, can be a rough day. A, a rough life. Things can be going uh, in a manner that, um, you know, that, that is adverse. In the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I'll cry unto God and to God that performeth all these things for me. Who is there to protect me? Who is there to care for me? Who is there to keep me in times of trouble? A merciful God keeps us in times of trouble. Amen? We go to him because we know that he's there to, to protect us and to provide for us, to guide us and keep us. Amen? Hallelujah. Go with me over to Psalm 116. 116. Uh, 
I love the Lord because he hath heard my cry and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. And we stop here because here's a man who is in distress. He's feeling uh, under the attack of the enemy. He's feeling bombarded, perhaps uh, thoughts with, uh, with, um, with doubts, with, uh, with fears of all sorts. And he calls upon the Lord. And, 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 and you don't get the impression again that here he is looking for forgiveness, but he's very interested in mercy, isn't he? He's interested in God's help, his care, his keeping power, his protection. <clears throat> and he knows that the Lord is good. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. He wants us to be a people at rest in him. We fret, we worry, we get troubled. Sometimes there's good cause for us to be troubled. Yes, if we have, if we have conducted ourselves in a sinful manner. But again, dealing with that rightly, we, we go to God. Sometimes there is no sin, but our souls are troubled. We live in a wicked world. Uh, the, just the, the course that this world is on can be unsettling. You know, as, 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 as hard as we may try to keep our eyes on the things that are above, to see the world going on the course that it is on, and to see wicked, just wickedness uh, just <clears throat> at every turn. Uh, I mean, people are, 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 are I mean, they, they parade and they, they preach and demand the right to shed the innocent blood of babies. Isn't that, isn't that, I mean, just, just so evil, so, so, so foul, so satanic. But that's the culture that we live in. They demand the right to slaughter innocent babies. That's a wicked world we live in. And that, in, among a, you know, a thousand other evils, can be very unsettling to us as Christians. This world seems very big to us sometimes, and the powers of darkness seem all but overwhelming sometimes. We run to God for his mercy, for his care, for his compassion. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. Rest in Jesus. Put your hope in God. Amen? Go with me over to Luke chapter 15. Let's take some time over there before we finish up for this evening. I'd like us to look at both um, the first two parables that Jesus tells here. The first one we refer to is the, you know, the parable of the lost sheep. And we'll begin reading at verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Jesus was accused of being a friend of publicans and sinners. The whole need not a physician. Amen? Amen? But them that are sick, he said. The Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. He spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Isn't that a blessing? 
just to see the heart of, of, of the Lord here. Amen? This is, there's joy among the angels. There's joy in the presence of God over one sinner that comes to repentance. God's a God of mercy and kindness and compassion. And if his disposition is, toward, is this toward the sinner, then how much more toward his children? Amen? Amen? If there's joy in the presence of the angels of God in heaven, <clears throat> over one sinner that repents, how much joy he takes in his children who are walking before him humbly, loving him, just walking in his ways. And yes, if, uh, you know, children, I mean, parents, it's, 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 a, it's a blessing. I was telling some uh, uh, over the weekend, but there have been just a number of times here lately where in speaking to young Elias, you know, to correct him, just, just like that, okay. It's been such a blessing, just over and over again. Elias, I don't want you to do that. Okay. No resistance, no running off, no fight. Okay. I mean, that's such a joy to, to observe that, to see that. Um, that's just, uh, as, 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 as we would all know, parents know, I mean, that's just the, you know, the, the result of, of, of careful and consistent instruction. That's a, that's a delight, isn't it? Am I, am I grieved that I had to speak to him again? No, I find it a delight that he responded so well. <laughs> Amen? And so it is with our Father. He takes joy and delight when his people come to him. Even, even though it may be coming to him, Lord, I'm asking you, you know, forgive, asking you to forgive me again. The re only reason you're going is because he brought it to your attention. He's the one that said, hey, stop doing that. And you said, okay. <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. You say, okay. <laughs> forgive me. Yeah. And that's just a delight to Father, isn't it? There's joy in, in the heart of our Father when, when we respond in the humility before him because he's compassionate toward us. He's, he cares about us. As a father pitieth his children, so our Father pitieth us. Amen? And then, <clears throat> you know, we, we can't come to Luke 15 on this subject without going to this, uh, this parable down in uh, the picks it up in verse 11. <clears throat> a certain man had two sons. Amen. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he delivered unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough in despair, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, and had compassion, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to the servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make, make merry, be merry. This is the heart of Father toward us, his people. Amen? Amen? Yeah. This is God's heart toward 
humanity. He looks at human beings, looking for people to humbly acknowledge their transgression and call on the name of the Lord Jesus. And this is the heart of Father toward every one of us. He wants us to come to him, doesn't he? Of course, there's the initial you know, uh, acknowledgement of our lost condition, uh, us being dead in trespasses and sins and undeserving of the smallest of his mercies. But he wants us to come to him. He's always looking. If you've been distant from the Lord, if you've been allowed your love for him to grow cold, you've been uh, astray, again, maybe not totally backslidden. I mean, you're here tonight. You can't be totally backslidden, right? <laughs> but your love for the Lord has grown a little cold. And it's not the way it should be. Uh, then go back home. Go back to Father's house. Amen? He's looking for you. He knows that your, your heart has wandered and you've been divided in your affections. And he's just waiting for you to turn around and come back to him, isn't he? Yeah, he sure is. He's looking, watching the horizon always. He's always, he's always attuned to a, a change of heart, a, a tenderness of heart, a, a readiness and a willingness that he would observe in us to acknowledge that, yep, I've, uh, I've been distant. I've been, uh, I've been negligent in the relationship. He's been there for me, but I've not been seeking him, uh, though he's been bidding me to seek him. I've allowed, you know, cares and the things of this world to come on in and, and start to choke out that life. And, and he knows when there's a change of heart and a turning back toward him, doesn't he? He's, he's, he's very attuned to that, isn't he? We don't have to come and, and uh, do all these things to demonstrate that there is a, this big change of heart. He sees the change of heart. He sees the, the inner man, doesn't he? Yep, and he sees when there's that, that tenderness toward him and a desire to, yeah, to come back to the first love and to, and to seek him with the whole heart again. He sees that. He's a very, very good father, a loving heavenly father. He's merciful toward us. His disposition is, is, is uh, toward kindness and compassion. That's his father. That's the fatherly heart of our God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. His mercies are from everlasting to everlasting. It will never cease to be so. That is, <clears throat> uh, you know, we'll said, I'll say it one more time. You know, you may look back on uh, your life as being characterized by these cycles of drawing near to God and being more fervent in your devotion to him. And then you allow one thing or another to come along and creep on in and, and, uh, and, and begin to choke out that life. And the love and devotion to the Lord isn't what it has been in the past. And then you've, you know, you've bounced back and you've been more devout and you've been more serious and you've been more fervent in your love for him. And then again, you've allowed that love to, to wane and the, the cares to enter on in. And there are things that have choked out some of that life in you. Maybe, maybe you look at your, your walk and you think that that's, you know, that's sort of, that cycle has is, is been, been all too characteristic of, of your, your relationship with the Lord. Well, <clears throat> come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Because he is, he is ever watching. He's ever drawing us to himself, at work in us, encouraging us that we can always come. He's very compassionate. He's always ready to receive us unto himself, isn't he? Yep, he is. Always drawing us ever more deeply into a, a precious communion with him, that we would love him with our whole heart. He's got so much love for us. The mercies of God are from everlasting to everlasting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do so thank you that you are such a good father to us. And we want to be good children, faithful and consistent in our love for you. Many here this evening would acknowledge that they have been inconsistent in their devotion to you. Lord, help us to acknowledge that. And help us to be sensitive enough to your spirit that we would be ready and willing to confess any specific sin and receive the promised forgiveness for that sin, and then move forward in our love for you and in the love that you have for us. You're a merciful God. You care about us. 
You're compassionate, always compassionate. Not just when we're down, not just when we've fallen and failed. You're always compassionate. And we thank you for that, Father God. Help us, O oh Lord, to seek your face, to draw near to you, to believe the love that you have for us. Thank you, O oh Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's stand together and minister to the Lord in song. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There is sound theology in that lyric that says that the wrath of God has been completely satisfied. There is no animosity, no... Uh, vengeful attitude in the slightest that the Lord has toward us. Only compassion, only love and care, mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Bless these, your people, Father God. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Agree one another in the love of the Lord Jesus. God's grace and peace go with you all.